Hi, this is Jim Bowen, and this is the CEGR 3143 Hydraulics and Hydrology Online Notes. This is Fluid Statics 3, Hydrostatic Forces on Plane Surfaces, and also Curved Surfaces. But in this part of the lecture, we're only going to talk about plane surfaces. We're covering sections 2.8 to 2.10 in the text. This is a very important topic because many, many applications of what we're learning in this section you'll find in structures, geotech, and in environmental and you will certainly be tested on this material on the FE exam. There are two parts to this. Planar surfaces and curved surfaces are typically handled differently. We're going to cover plane surfaces in this lecture. There are two things that we can calculate for a plane surface. First of all, the magnitude of the resultant force on that plane surface and also its point of application. On a curved surface, the two things that we would typically calculate are the hydrogen static force is decomposed into a horizontal component of force and a vertical component of force. We'd also calculate the locations of those two forces. We'll find that there are equations for each of these. We'll also find that in calculating the horizontal force on a curved surface, we'll use the result from a plane surface. So that's where we'll start with plane surfaces. The basis of all of these calculations is the linear variation in pressure that occurs within a fluid that is not moving, a static fluid. Recall the equations from earlier in this section, dp dz equals minus gamma. Pressure increases as the elevation decreases at a rate equal to the specific weight of the fluid. A second equation is that uh, if you want to know the pressure at a given location, you can calculate that as the pressure at a different location, a reference pressure to which you'd add an amount gamma times the distance between those two positions. Here's a representation of that linear variation in pressure. And what I'm indicating here is that the gauge pressure, P sub G, is equal to gamma H. That is, the reference pressure, P0 in this case, is 0. And we're wanting to calculate the resultant force and its point of application on a planar surface that's in the x direction has a dimension b and in the vertical z direction has a dimension h. Here's a figure from the text showing a pressure acting on the bottom of a tank. The pressure is perpendicular to the horizontal surface so therefore the resultant force acts downward. And in this case, the pressure is uniform along the entire bottom area of the tank. And it's equal to a value P equals gamma H. That's a gauge pressure. We might also calculate the resultant force on the sides of the tank. And in that case, we've got pressure that varies from zero at the surface to a value gamma H at the bottom. Let's do a simple example. Find the magnitude of the downward force and we'll take this h equal to a half a meter, and we'll take the width of the tank to be one meter and the depth into the page to also be one meter. So the bottom surface area is therefore one meter squared. And like I said, the depth is half a meter. For this example, P equals gamma h is equal to 4.9 kilopascals. And the resultant force would be that pressure, that constant pressure that's acting on all of the bottom area. That P would then be multiplied times the bottom area to get the resultant force. We can also calculate for this example the forces on the sidewall with the geometry that I had previously described, the bottom area being one meter squared and the depth being half a meter. The two side areas are half a meter squared. We can calculate the resultant force on the sides, F sub S, as the average pressure on the sides times the surface area of the sides. Average pressure would be half of the pressure at the bottom of the tank, since it's varying linearly, which, to which we'd multiply that average pressure times the surface area. In our example, this is the pressure on the bottom. We divide it by two, we multiply it times the side area, and we get a, a force on the side of 1.22 kilonewtons, which is one-fourth of the force 
on the bottom area. What we're looking for then is an equation for the magnitude of the resultant force for a plane surface. Since P varies with depth, we'll need to integrate the pressure over the area to get the horizontal force on the sidewall. That gives an equation F sub R is the integral of, the, of P times a differential area. Substituting in our equation for P, we get the resultant force is the integral of gamma H dA. Now let's consider a sloping wall, the left side being vertical, but the right, the right side slopes at an angle theta of 45 degrees from the horizontal. With that configuration, the left side would have the half meter squared area that we had before, and the distance down the side wall is h equals y sine theta. Using that to get the side angle, we find that this sloping area on the side is equal to square root of 2 over 2 meters squared. This distance is larger than this distance, so the side area is larger. h is our depth, and y we're going to use as our distance down the side. Now, one thing I wanted you to think about is imagine this tank were on rollers. You would not expect it to move to the left or two to the right. And what that implies is the horizontal components of the hydrostatic force on the left hand side and the right hand side are equal. No motion means no difference between the force on the left hand side and the right hand side, at least its horizontal component. Pulling out the constants gamma and sine theta, we get F sub r equals gamma sine theta times this integral y dA over a. From calculus, you'll see that this integral is the first moment about the an axis x that is perpendicular to y direction and along the water surface. That first moment can be uh, substituted here that y dA is equal to the centroidal distance times the surface, times the area of the surface. Plugging this result into here, we get a very simple result for the resultant force on a plane surface area. We get a very simple result for the resultant force on a plane surface that, that, that it is equal to gamma times the depth to the centroid times the surface area. Steve, what I think is interesting about this is that our equation doesn't depend on the angle of the slope. This one equation works for horizontal surfaces, vertical surfaces, and all surfaces in between. Let's now use our equation to solve the resultant force on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left-hand side, we find that, remember, it's gamma H sub C times surface area, the gamma for water, depth to the centroid, the depth to the centroid, the left side is a rectangle. It's half meter high and one meter into the paper. The depth to the centroid would be half of the depth, one half or one quarter meter. And then the surface area as we calculated before is a half meter squared. Putting those values in, the resultant force on the left side is 1.22 Newtons, the same value that we previously calculated. Let's use that equation now to find the resultant force on the right side, that sloping side. Uh, F sub r on the right is gamma, 9.79. The depth to the centroid is the same, half of the depth, or a quarter meter, and there's the area that we calculated previously, square root of 2 over 2 meters squared, meaning the resultant force on the right-hand side is actually a larger number than the resultant force on the left-hand side, which, which you might say, well, wait a minute, how can that be You've got a resultant force on the right-hand side greater than the resultant force on the left-hand side. We thought they were equal. And what I said was they, what's equal are the horizontal components. This resultant on the right-hand side acts perpendicular to the plane surface, 
meaning it's acting downward at an angle 45 degrees from the horizontal. The horizontal component of the resultant force on the right-hand side is what we expect it to be 1.22 newtons. The other thing we need to know is the location of the resultant. And we like to consider surfaces with a slope. To do that, it's best to use a figure that we'll show on the next page, which is from the text, where we've got a slope that is an angle theta from the horizontal. We've got an arbitrarily shaped surface that lies on that slope, and we're interested in calculating the resultant force, the hydrostatic force on that plane surface. Y is the distance down the surface, and using our equations, we could calculate the centroidal distance down the surface, that we call that Y sub C. You can also calculate the distance down the surface to the resultant, we call that Y sub R. And we know that the H sub C, depth to the centroid, is going to be Y sub C times sine theta. And X is the perpendicular direction in along the water surface or perpendicular to Y in the plane that we're interested in. To get the location of the resultant, what we're going to do is find the center of pressure. We're going to call this Y sub R, and that should be a capital R. And what we'll find is that Y sub R is not equal to Y sub C. That is, the location of the center of pressure is not the centroidal distance. The equations for Y sub R and X sub R, there's a distance from the centroid in the other direction, can be found by summing moments caused by the pressure distribution on the surface. The equation that you come up with is that y sub r, the distance down the slope to the resultant, is a moment of inertia i sub xc, and it's the moment of inertia about the axis x going through the centroid. So that i sub xc divided by y sub c divided by a plus y sub c. It will always be a larger distance to the resultant than it would is to the centroid. There's also an equation for x sub r. It uses a different moment of inertia. It's the product of the inertia of the xy axis, also taken about the centroid. What we'll find is that this special moment is always zero for any surface that's symmetric about either axis, either the x-axis or the y-axis, as it passes through the centroid. This is in your text. This is probably too small to read. I can make it larger. The ones that we will commonly see is a rectangle and a circle. Let's do an example. We'll take a vertical surface. That is, we have a hatch that's lying vertically along a surface, meaning our theta, that angle for the surface is equal to 90 degrees. Our resultant force will be horizontal. F sub r will be to the right and act somewhere along this hatch. The hatch, the top of the hatch is five feet below the water surface, and the hatch has a diameter, a circular diameter of three feet. What we'd like to find is the magnitude of the resultant force and the depth to the resultant force. Our equations going to that figure with the equation is that I sub xc pi times d to the fourth divided by 64. d is the diameter of the circle. The area of the circular hatch is pi d squared over 4. We plug values in our three foot diameter, we get that A is 7.07 .07 feet squared, and our moment of inertia, I sub XC, is 3.98 feet to the fourth. We also need the depth to the centroid, and the centroid of this circular area is going to be halfway down the hatch, so that's going to be 
h sub c is 5 plus 3 halves, 6.5 feet. Plugging all these values into our equations, f sub r is gamma hca, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot for water. Depth of the centroid is 6.5 feet. Area of our circular hatch is 7.07 .07 feet squared. That gives us a resultant force of 2,868 pounds. What is the depth to the center of pressure, h sub r? We're using equation for h sub r rather than y sub r because h sub r equals y sub r when the surface is vertical. So our equation is then h sub r equals i sub xc over hc times a plus hc. Plug in values for those terms. We get 3.98 feet to the fourth divided by 6.5 feet divided by 7.07 .07 feet squared. To that we add the depth to the centroid which is 6.5 feet. What we find then is that depth to the, to the center of pressure is 6.59. That's the end of this part of the lecture.